Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so welcome to In Character. Uh, this is a series of conversations in which researchers who have been studying moral character talk to each other about their research and explore some of the connections between their research programs. Uh, I'm Jeff Goodwin. I'm an assistant professor in, in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I primarily study moral judgment and reasoning and I'm here with Taya Cohen. Hi, I'm Taya Cohen. I'm an assistant professor of organizational behavior in theory at the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University and I study moral character and unethical behavior in the workplace. Thank you, Jeff. So yeah, just to give you an overview then about the conversation today, we're going to be talking about our respective research programs on the subject of moral character. Uh, Tyra and I were both part of the Character Project, which was run out of Wake Forest University by Christian Miller, Will Fleeson and Mike Furr, and funded by the John Templeton Foundation. And so the projects we conducted as part of the Character Project explored moral character in, in different ways. My research in this area has primarily focused on the role of character in person perception, social cognition and impression formation. Ty's research has focused more on the role of actual character in uh, predicting and determining people's behaviour in real world workplace contexts. So we're going to talk about both of those projects. They are quite different, but there are some complementary themes running through our work and they touch upon some of the same big ideas which we'll try to get to in this conversation. Um, so we're going to start with Ty's research. I'll start by uh, asking Ty some questions about her research and exploring that and then we'll switch things around. Okay, thanks Jeff. Um, okay, so, so Ty, you've been looking at the role of character in the workplace in particular and how a person's moral character predicts their likelihood of engaging in moral and immoral behaviours in the workplace. And um, first off, I just want to say I think this is really nice and important work. It's really pushed the ball forward in terms of our understanding of, of what character is and, and its importance in predicting real world behaviour. So first off, congrats on this. Thank on, you very much. Um, and you've got a number of important recent papers in this area, including a, one that's in press in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. That's great. Uh, you've also been writing about some of the general issues about moral character that arise out of this work. One of your recent chapters is titled uh, Moral Character, What It Is and What It Does. So I, I first wanted to start talking about your studies of character in the workplace and then perhaps we can turn to some more general questions about the nature of character itself. Um, so the, to start off, I wonder if you could start by talking a little bit about the kinds of behaviours in workplace settings that you've looked at. Um, you know, how is it that people actually act morally or immorally in, in the workplace? Sure. So uh, in a lot of my work, I've focused on two key kinds of workplace behaviours that we call counterproductive work behaviours and organisational citizenship. And basically, these are behaviours that harm organizations or the people within them or that help organizations or the people within them. Um, so they're intentional behaviors. Um, so the harmful behaviors are things like stealing something that belongs to your employer or putting in to be paid more hours than you work, uh, purposely damaging equipment or property, and those would all be focused toward the organization. And then there's also more interpersonal behaviors like insulting or making fun of co-workers, blaming someone for errors that you made, threatening people at work, or in extreme cases, abuse. Uh, and then on the other side, the positive side, are what's called organizational citizenship behavior. And these are things like uh, taking time to advise or mentor a coworker, changing vacation schedules or shifts to accommodate coworkers' needs, um, helping coworkers have too much to do, or straightening up common work areas. And what's somewhat different about focusing on uh, these harmful and helpful work behaviors is that these aren't necessarily moral dilemmas. I mean, these are behaviors people agree that are right or wrong, or helpful or harmful, um, but some people do more of these than others. And what I've been interested in is what predicts these behaviors, uh, what predicts the helping behaviors and the harmful behaviors, mm -hmm. um, and then can we predict this from personality, can we predict this also from aspects of the work environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so in, in relation to those, those behaviors, um, how, do you, how do you go about measuring them, whether or not somebody's actually committed to something like that? Yeah, so this is... Um, a question that can be answered in a lot of different ways. So one of the ways is by people's self-reports. So in some of the work we've asked people in anonymous surveys to report how frequently they've done, done these different behaviors at their workplace. Um, so these are self-reports. And then another complementary way that I've approached this is by asking people's coworkers to um, ask, you know, how often did your coworker do each of these behaviors over the past week or the past month? Um, and 
What's interesting is that we see a lot of convergence. So the same people who say, I'm doing a lot of these harmful behaviors, um, are the same people whose coworkers say, yeah, this person's doing a lot of these harmful behaviors, or vice versa. The people that say, I'm doing a lot of these helpful behaviors, their coworkers also agree that they're doing a lot of these um, helpful behaviors. So we see a lot of convergence, because obviously there are advantages and disadvantages of both of these kinds of methods. Um, so people have more access, they're more aware of their own behaviors, of their mm -hmm. own thoughts and feelings, what's actually happening, um, but they might not want to share that information. And that's why we ask in online surveys when they're anonymous, when there shouldn't be a lot of impression management concerns. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, um, the coworkers, uh, they can only see a limited range of behaviors, but they might not feel as um, inhibited from actually describing what the, the person is doing if the person um, it doesn't want to describe their own behaviors, maybe a coworker. So right. yeah. um, I feel kind of confident um, in our work. What's been nice is when we see the convergence across the two methods. Yeah, that convergence is, de is definitely interesting. And you can certainly imagine that people would, be, would want not to report on various of their sort of harmful or immoral behaviors. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you get that convergence is, is I think, quite, quite, quite reassuring. Mm -hmm. um, so I, just another sort of broad question about these behaviors. So I, I, I sort of um, am curious to know why, why you think these behaviors are important in the workplace. I mean, obviously, the, the moral character of them um, makes them seem important for some reasons. But I'm wondering if, um, you know, can you, is there any way to sort of tell how costly these sorts of things or how beneficial they might be to an organization? Yes, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, so some work has suggested that these harmful behaviors like stealing office supplies and these kinds of things can cost organizations billions of dollars. Um, and it can be in direct costs, just like the total cost of these like supplies, for example, but then it could be indirect costs like people missing work shifts or people leaving their jobs. Um, if their coworkers are doing these sorts of things, it might cause a terrible work environment. So I think uh, you can look at the small behaviors and see how they in aggregate can cause terrible work cultures when they're negative or on the other side when they're positive can create really beneficial cultures uh, mm. cultures where people are more engaged have higher job satisfaction so I think there's the direct costs uh, and benefits of the harmful and helpful work behaviors but then uh, what I think is even more interesting is the more indirect effects over time how this might create a culture in an organization um, and, and certainly um, there are other estimates of financial costs that you can uh, add up that maybe um, could suggest about the monetary expenses, but I think there's so much more than just monetary costs and benefits right. of, of these behaviors. Yeah, a whole range of things. That's interesting. Okay, so you've got these behaviors on the one hand, and then you're trying to predict them using some uh, some notional measure of moral character. So how is it that you conceive of moral character, and, and how do you go about measuring it in terms of trying to predict these sorts of behaviors? Uh, so I think of moral character as uh, different aspects of personality. So if we think of um, personality as an individual's characteristic patterns of thoughts, emotions, behaviors, um, we can think of moral character as the subset of individual differences or the, uh, that's relevant to ethics and morality. So um, an individual's disposition to think, feel, behave in an ethical versus unethical manner. And when I think of moral character, I'm thinking of it as a collection of traits. So a trait uh, is an un unobservable psychological construct that encapsulates different patterns of thought, emotion, behavior into a coherent unit. Mm -hmm. um, and traits facilitate understanding of how individuals differ from one another. The other. And that's why we sometimes think of it as individual differences. So I think of moral character as a collection of traits that, like other aspects of personality, are relatively stable and enduring over a person's life, but also capable of change. Uh, mm -hmm. And but that probably do change over time and across different situations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what were so in terms of predicting both moral and immoral behaviors? What what were the kinds of traits or measures that did did the best job in 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 predicting them? So uh, in our research, we looked at a lot of different traits, and so one of the issues in the literature currently that we wanted to address was to um, figure out what aspects of personality are important because people study a lot of different things and over there's been decades of research on this um, so some of the things that mattered um, are those that you might expect so there are traits that are about how considerate you are of other people so things like empathy and perspective taking um, these have a long history in psychology of, of being related to moral development mm -hmm. there's other traits like conscientiousness um, and self-control 
um, being able to self-regulation. And, and these traits also seem important. And one of the traits that I've studied um, in the past is something called guilt proneness, mm -hmm. which is this disposition to uh, anticipate that you would feel guilty if you did something wrong, even if no one knew about it. So I see it like having a conscience. Do you think, oh, if I did something wrong, I'd feel bad about it? Um, and, and all of these traits were found to be important for moral character. They predicted moral behaviors uh, up to very, several months after the initial assessment of character. Um, and then um, there were also some variables that we looked at that people have studied for a long time that we didn't find to be particularly relevant. And I think those are some of the most interesting. Um, so one in particular uh, is what's called cognitive moral development or moral reasoning ability. And there's a long history in the developmental psychology and also industrial organizational psychology of people studying people's moral reasoning ability or their moral development. And what we found was that moral development wasn't um, very related to these other character traits. It was basically uncorrelated with things like conscientiousness and empathy and these other aspects of character. And it didn't predict the counterproductive work behaviors or organizational citizenship or these other helpful, harmful behaviors. Um, and, and why I think this is interesting is because there's been a lot of research attention uh, focused on moral development, and I think what it probably predicts is not these behaviors that everybody agrees about that are right or wrong, but maybe the more difficult situations that do occur, but much more rarely than sort of these basic behaviors about what's right and wrong. Mm, that's interesting, yeah, because certainly in the field of moral judgment, where, where I do, do most of my research, this idea of how people reason about morality is, is thought to be quite an important one. So it is kind of, it, it's certainly interesting to me that it wasn't predicting that well in, in your studies. Yeah. But so you attribute it to the sort of the unambiguously moral or immoral nature of the behaviors you're, you're trying to predict, basically. I think so. So I think often in, in moral psychology and moral judgments, um, researchers are asking questions about these really complicated situations. You know, should a person steal drugs to save his dying wife, or um, right. should you kill one person to save five, you know, by a different means, and, um, you know, if they're sort of trolley racing down the track, or these other really kind of complicated situations where different values are in play. And what I've been interested in is these behaviors um, like stealing or lying where, uh, it's not like there's a big moral dilemma. It's just that um, people agree they're right or wrong, but some people do them for different reasons. And mm -hmm. I think when we think uh, of moral character, and a lot of these traits are more relevant to that uh, than moral reasoning ability, because you don't need uh, a sophisticated level of moral reasoning and complexity to um, know that stealing, harming others, insulting, abusing others is wrong, and helping others, um, mm -hmm. mentoring others is uh, a better thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so did the nature of these, these relationships surprise you or were they, were they sort of what you were expecting in terms of what ended up predicting moral and immoral behavior in the workplace? Um, so, some, so I think some of them um, didn't surprise me. Um, so things like empathy or guilt proneness uh, weren't particularly surprising. I, I take guilt proneness in particular was reassuring because I had um, published several papers prior to that. Um, so, oh. But I, I didn't have a clear sense going into the research program about uh, which of these traits would emerge as particularly important. So there were others. Um, so things like agreeableness is a broad dimension of personality that is related to what I think you and I will talk about later when we talk about warmth and um, sort of, and that's had some uh, relationships with helping behaviors in the past. And agreeableness was not found to be particularly important, sort of being a warm, kind person. Mm. It wasn't completely irrelevant, but not as important as um, some of these other uh, aspects of personality. Mm -hmm. um, I Going into the research, I wasn't sure where identity, moral identity, would come into play. If some people care about being the kind of person who is fair and kind and hardworking, and that's really a core part of their identity. And um, we found in our work that that was uh, also very important for predicting these counterproductive behaviors and citizenship behaviors. But going into the research, I, I'm not sure um, whether I would have known that that trait was more or less important than, say, moral reasoning ability or um, or something else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, right. That that was interesting. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of want to get back to that issue of moral identity a bit later on. Um, one thing I wanted to key in on now, though, is one thing I, that I found really interesting in, in your results is looking at um, the fact that co-workers tended to rate people with high moral character uh, as having performed more of these good behaviors, the citizenship behaviors you were describing. Um, but the people with high character themselves, I, I think if I'm reading this correctly, didn't actually 
rate themselves as having performed more of those good behaviours than people with moderate or low character. And that sort of in intrigued me. Um, yeah. um, so I guess I was just curious as to what, what, what your thoughts are as to why that might have been. Yeah. So, so it is interesting. So we did find a, a small difference between the people with high uh, character and low character, but it wasn't very large as you suggest. And certainly it wasn't as distinct as it was with the harmful behaviors where we see, saw pretty big differences. And so it could be uh, modesty that um, moral people are, aren't even aware that they're uh, helping others. They just uh, see it as sort of as part of their job. They're not even recognizing this. Um, so their coworkers may see them doing these behaviors, but the employees themselves don't think too much about it. They don't even notice. Um, of course, another possibility is that the coworkers are wrong and they're mistakenly assuming that the employee is doing more citizenship behaviors than they actually are. And this gets to this question of accuracy, which right, of these right. reports is it the self reports of behavior that are more accurate or the coworker reports. Um, it's probably um, some combination. So mm -hmm. um, basically, we see the same pattern is just much stronger as, as you suggest when the co we're looking at the co-workers reports about the employees behaviors right um, right and it could be even though we tried to be very straightforward and clear about uh, what the behaviors are to make them very concrete like you <clears> helped a co-worker with their um, with certain tasks or you um, volunteered for extra assignments but it could be that people have different standards in rating their own behavior than rating others behavior Right, right. But in terms and in terms of the harmful stuff, you did see quite a bit of convergence with Yes, the, like, yeah, a big convergence. So the the people who rated themselves as low in moral character both self reported a lot more unethical behavior and their coworkers reported a lot more unethical behavior. And what I thought was interesting there was we didn't see much difference between um, the people that might be classified as average, who had sort of moderate scores on the moral character measures, and the people that had very high scores on the moral character measures, mm -hmm. neither of those groups were committing a lot of bad behaviors. But this, um, a group of people that, let's say the bottom 20% of so, who had the lowest scores on the moral character measures, they were committing a lot of these bad behaviors, sometimes up to um, 15 to 20 of these behaviors per week, according to their own reports about themselves. So, um, yeah, so it, it's it's quite a bit, and I think this is the idea that one bad apple in an organization really do, can spoil the the whole climate. And um, yeah. you know, just having a few of these people low in moral character in an organization can lead to a lot of bad behavior. Right. I guess there could be some possibility of sort of social contagion or or um, modeling effects to some extent. Yeah. Um, so this is a question I'm sure you've encountered before, but I guess. There's, a, there's a, a question here about the direction of causation and what the nature of the causal links are here. You're, you're obviously able to predict these moral and immoral behaviours through measures of character. Um, and I'm assuming you, you interpret that as being, as it obviously being consistent with a causal model that runs from character to the behaviours. Yeah. I guess I'm just curious about your thoughts about what causally is, is going on here. Yeah. Yeah, so it's an interesting question, um, especially when you're thinking of personality um, and experimental manipulations aren't always the best way to approach that. So mm -hmm. I think when um, you can't use experimental manipulations, the next best thing to do is to look at things over time. Um, so one of the reasons why we conducted a series of surveys over three months rather than just one single survey um, is to look at how people's personalities at an initial time point then predicts their future behavior. And right. um, we can look at the behavior, whether it changes over time or just look at, you know, what do they say um, in the initial survey and how does that uh, map onto what they do 12 weeks later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we asked about their employees, uh, we asked the employees in the study about their personalities and about their work environment and all these different aspects of the organization um, in the first survey. And then for a series of 12 weeks, we surveyed them about their behaviors, what they did, the positive and negative behaviors, as well as how they were treated and their emotions and other things. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the other point I'd like to make, not only uh, looking over time, is that um, it's also possible that causality runs in both directions. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, I think the relationship between moral behavior and character is probably bidirectional. Um, so what I mean is I assume a person's character causes their behavior, as you pointed out. So if I'm more empathic, if I'm more guilt-prone, if I have um, more, if I'm more conscientious, I will behave more ethically later. Um, but over time, patterns of behavior can also influence a person's personality and their character. So if I continually behave in an unethical manner, if I'm continually acting in counterproductive ways at my job, it's likely I could be uh, become uh, less empathic, less guilt-prone, less conscientious over time. Right, right. So personality and behavior aren't 
really separate in some sense because personality is in a sense determined um, by a person's habitual ways of behaving. Mm -hmm. um, so what I, I guess what I think though is most interesting is that we can just ask a few personality questions at one time point and that we can have all this power to predict people's behavior three months later um, yeah. It does suggest that there, there's something that's constant um, that holds over time uh, that I, I see as causal. That, right. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that sort of lag in the design. I think that's nice. And you also controlled for a bunch of other sort of possible confounding variables as well. Yeah, yeah. So we tried to rule out um, different demographic differences in age or gender, for example. Um, we also looked at things like income or whether there's an ethics code in the organization. Mm. Um, you know, we find that a bad work environment uh, does predict bad behavior, as you would expect. So when people are mistreated at work, when there's conflict in the organization, um, that also does lead to increases in counterproductive behavior or decreases in citizenship behavior. Mm. But we can control for that in our statistical analyses and still show this uh, role of personality in predicting behavior. Right, right, right. Interesting, yeah. Um, okay, so I want to move to a couple of sort of more general questions about moral character and how you conceive of it. Um, so in your work you, you see morality and moral character as having primarily to do with optimizing and regulating social relationships and morality as being about sort of harming versus helping. Uh, so on this kind of conception I guess moral character is primarily about cooperating with others, harmonizing interpersonal relationships and, and that's a view that I think does have a lot of support in the literature. But I wondered what you thought about cases where doing the moral th thing what, or what is arguably the moral thing might actually be the the behave the very behavior that upsets people and that might actually cause problems or the destruction of personal relationships so i'm sort of thinking of a case in a workplace context where let's say a supervisor is in the position of having to give really honest feedback to somebody who's performing very badly with the cost being that it, it really upsets that person and harms them emotionally in some way um, so, you know, here you've got the value of honesty coming up against the value of being compassionate or, or nice or something like that. Or you could think of a case of whistleblowing where, you know, an employee is going to cause significant harm to members of the organization by reporting on some unethical behavior that's going on. Um, I guess I'm just curious, what do you think of the role of moral character in cases like this is? And do you think you could predict what people are going to do in those sorts of situations with some measure of character? I think it's a really interesting question um, and a difficult one to some extent. Uh, so the, the basic question is about what would moral character predict when different relationships are in conflict or um, in different moral dilemmas where various values um, are in opposition. So whistleblowing, if you think of fairness versus loyalty. Um, and so my thinking here is based in large part on some earlier work by Tage Ryan, Alan Page Fisk who describe morality as relationship regulation. And the basic point they make is that people's moral motives and their corresponding behaviors are determined in large part by the type of relational model that's active at that time the person is making a decision. And a key part of the theory is that the term relationship is used quite broadly. Mm -hmm. So it's not limited just to those relationships with the people in the immediate social setting. Um, so it could refer more broadly to more abstract relationships uh, or even a person's relationship with all of humanity. And I, I think this is where, um, you know, the term relationship, you can think about the employer and the employee giving the tough feedback, as you suggest. That's one relationship, but the employer might value um, other principles that are more important to the organization as a whole, like having fair practices or getting, um, or doing other things that might optimize different kind of abstract relationships. Right, I see. So, so what's important to uh, keep in mind, I think, is the way in which an individual defines what is right or wrong and which is determined by the different kinds of relationships they might be thinking about, whether it's those outside the organization, those within the organization, all of humanity. Um, so those relationships, what they're thinking about, what's right or wrong, that's paramount to understanding how that person will behave. Okay. So, 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 so I think, yeah, just to clarify, I think in some cases the worst moral offender from an outsider's perspective could even be regarded as a moral hero by members of one's in-group or right. one's close circle circle. Um, and there again, it's what's right or wrong is sometimes more ambiguous there. Right. Okay. No, I see that. So to be sort of a misinterpretation to regard it as having only to do with direct proximal relationships, there's sort of an other, other more abstract things going on that need to be considered. Yeah, I think so. And 
um, you bring up a good point in that maybe relationship makes it seem like it's just about those immediate relationships, but with something like honesty, um, maybe being honest can be harmful to a particular person, but over time, maybe in the, that there could be consequences to other people by dishonesty or even consequences in the future to that person. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just about the immediate social relationships, but um, e relationships over time, relationships so, with others, right, right, um, right. and balancing those. So. Uh, in, in some previous work I had done on a topic we call group morality, we had looked at how making different kinds of relationships more salient, whether it's relationships to people's in-group or those uh, making them feel like, what do you think your fellow group members think? If you make those relationships salient, then guilt proneness predicts different behaviors than if you make more abstract principles salient about um, being fair to everyone. So the same moral character trait, in this case we were looking at, at guilt, proneness might predict different behaviors depending on which relationships you make salient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in some of your um, recent work you've been conceptualizing your findings and what you've been doing uh, with regard to moral character in the workplace in terms of this model that, that divides moral character into three parts. On the one hand a, a motivation, a motivational component, an ability component and an identity component which you had mentioned earlier. Um, and this sort of gets at a broader question about what moral character is, how we should think about it, what the structure of it is. Uh, so I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the different, the three different facets in your model and how, how they relate to each other. Yeah. Uh, so when we, as, as I was saying before, when we went into this project, we wanted to look at a, a lot of different traits that people had been studying and we came up with about two dozen. Um, and at that point, when we started the project, we didn't have a clear idea of how they might relate to each other, or which ones would be more important. And over the course of several years when we were doing the research and really see what emer saw what emerged as important um, aspects of character and what, what predicted moral behavior, we started to see um, when, what I see as three different categories. Um, so one is uh, a broad category, I think, of con as consideration of others. Mm -hmm. And this might be a more motivational component. So. Uh, a disposition toward considering the needs and interests of other people, how one's own actions affect other people. I think empathy and perspective taking are clear examples of this. Um, when you think of honesty and humility as this broad personality dimension, I think that relates because you're being oriented towards other people and wanting to be honest with them or not, or being humble and not to um, place yourself over them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so th those all seem to be related in some way to this uh, consideration of others, broadly construed. And I saw those traits as different in many ways from the more uh, ability-oriented traits or self-regulation. So things like conscientiousness, self-control, um, even considering the future consequences of one's behavior and how that uh, influences self-control. So there are traits that reflect the disposition toward regulating one's behavior effectively um, with reference to behaviors that have positive short-term consequences, negative long-term consequences for oneself or others. Um, so this is the self-regulation component. Um, and, and previously in the literature on unethical behavior, we've seen people studying, some people studying self-regulation, others studying this uh, empathy and the mode of consideration of others, um, sometimes in pretty separate streams of research. And then there's this third area that um, is a bit related to the other two, but in some ways distinct, and that's identity and one's moral identity. Um, so I think of this as a disposition toward valuing morality and wanting to view oneself as a moral person. So mm -hmm. you can value consideration of others, you can value being generous and kind, you can yeah. value uh, hard work and self-regulation and uh, being and persistence. Um, and so and, I'm not sure if these are three distinct components. Um, I, I think they are related, but they do um, seem to tap into somewhat different aspects of personality. Mm -hmm. And then there are some traits that may reflect more than one of these. Um, aspects of personality. So when I was thinking of, of guilt proneness or this idea that you would anticipate you'd feel bad about your behavior if you did something wrong, well I can imagine that's relevant to um, being oriented towards others, so I'd feel bad if I harmed another person. Mm. You also could feel bad about failures of self-regulation, so maybe that's related to self-control in that way, um, or identity that you want to, um, that if you acted inconsistently with your identity you would feel guilty about it. And so it's not necessarily clear to me yet about how each of the different character traits that we've studied fit into these different components, but as a broad framework, um, our goal here was to say, was to kind of propose these three big areas to um, put, uh, put some structure on this uh, large kind of varied landscape that, of people, uh, that people were studying. Yeah, I think the distinction between motiv uh, motivation and identity is particularly interesting because at first I sort of had a little bit of trouble separating them, but I think I, 
I think I, I think they are quite different or potentially quite different. I mean, the way I sort of think about it is if you see somebody that's in need of assistance or something, the motivational component seems to be about an orientation to that person and a desire to, that that person's welfare be improved in some way. But the identity component is more about this this desire that I'm the one that's helping and yeah. that I'm somehow involved in correcting this situation. Mm -hmm. they, they do seem sort of different in that way to me. Yeah, so I think um, motivation, you can think of one's motivation to do good and avoid doing bad, whereas ability, um, you know, uh, self-regulation is the, the capability to do good and do and not do bad. And then identity is like, do you actually care that you're a moral person or not, which um, then the focus is on oneself and one's own identity, um, not necessarily just wanting to do good to others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, an interesting question you, you talk about in your in your work is has to do with the possibility of character development, um, and I think you nicely point out that this could be very beneficial for organisations, particularly given all of the costs you were referring to earlier about immoral behaviour. I'm curious how optimistic you are about the possibility of character development of this sort. Um, that's sort of one aspect, and I guess the other one would be related is, do you see more room for character development with respect to motivation, ability, or identity? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. I think people often think of personality and character as fixed and unchanging, that you're either born a certain way or after childhood you don't change. But um, what we're learning uh, about personality in general um, and, and character also is that people's personality do change over the course of their lives. Um, and I think of personality and character similar to habits. So it can be difficult to change your habits, uh, especially if they're well, uh, if they're really ingrained. So it can be difficult to quit smoking or to exercise more or other kinds of things people think of as habits. But with concerted effort or certain life changes, I think habits can change, and in that way, so can personality. Um, so character development then is, uh, I, you might think of it as developing different competencies, skills, developing better habits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then one of the ways I think the tripartite model, this idea of motivation, ability, identity might be helpful is then we can think of what interventions might we have that target different areas of, of moral character. Uh, so in terms of consideration of others, there's um, been some work earlier in different areas of psychology that's focused on developing empathy. There's earlier work from the 70s uh, that had to do primarily with race relations, things like the jigsaw classroom, getting children to work together in interdependent relationships. There's other work in terms of peace and conflict resolution that's also focused on things like empathy. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's possible we could look at what's been done in these other areas that foster consideration of others and then adapt that more for organizational context mm -hmm. um, or other character development programs um, self-regulation is one we, uh, I think we know more about failures of self-regulation, so we know now a lot about sleep, for example, and people are tired, um, they're bad at self-regulation, but we could also think of the opposite side, how do you give people more strength and, um, you know, help them have better schedules, for example, might be one way. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, so I'm hoping that by developing a sort of a framework for thinking about character, we can then relate this work to other areas where um, it could be clinical psychology areas or other work that's been done and social psychology for, um, that uh, help take these interventions that are used outside of the moral psychology area and then kind of bring them together in that way. Right. Yeah, that seems like a promising idea, sort of drawing on the expertise that may not have been developed in the moral sphere, but that could be useful. Yeah. Okay, so uh, last question I want to ask is just what, what are your next steps um, that you're aiming to take with this, this research? So. Um, so, so far what we've been looking at, uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, has been a lot with self-reports of character or with co-workers' reports. Uh, and I think um, an another big question to ask is, can we see moral character in others? So we're getting a sense now from mm. different measures of personality about what moral character is. And I think there's still work to be done there. But there's this whole question of, it, you know, if an employer wanted to know if an employee they were hiring is high or low in moral character, um, are there different questions they could ask in a personal relationship? Um, are there different indicators of character? So uh, one of the projects that I'm working on with one of my doctoral students uh, is on developing a battery of interview questions that we might be able to use to elicit moral character information mm. in situations where people don't know each other. So okay. we're still in early stages of this research, but we're piloting some questions um, and then looking at people's responses and seeing if judges can uh, either read or listen to people's responses and make judgments of a person's conscientiousness, of their guilt proneness, of their honesty or humility or these other character traits. Because um, 
um, w when we can kind of figure out what are the indicators of moral character, um, we can hopefully be better at judging them. So mm -hmm. that's why. Oh, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Okay. I'll look, look forward to saying that. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Jeff. That was great. And uh, now I think we can uh, turn to you. Okay. And uh, hear a little bit more about your research. So. You've studied how people form impressions of others, and in particular, how they form impressions of other people's moral characters. Uh, so let me begin by saying congratulations on your excellent publications in this area. Um, your recent article in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, I loved it. And um, I'm hoping we can hear more about some of, the, uh, some of that work and the motivations behind it. Uh, and so to begin, could you describe what you mean by the phrase moral character and how this attribute of a person is different from other attributes that psychologists study, such as, for example, warmth and competence, um, which are uh, have been studied for a long time within this person perception literature. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we had a fairly uh, broad view of what moral character is, and we here refers to me, um, Jared Piazza, and Paul Rosen. Um, a definition that I quite like of moral character comes from Joel Kupperman, who's a moral philosopher, and he he defined character in in terms of a person's normal pattern of thought and action especially in matters relating to the happiness of others and also of themselves and most especially in relation to moral choice. So that's a pretty open-ended definition of what character is, um, arguably a little circular, but I think it's appropriately broad. Um, but in, in terms of our actual research, we didn't really want to be constrained by any particular conception of what character was and, and we were mindful of not sort of imposing some pre-existing conception of character on our subject. So one of the things that we did in the research is uh, across a whole range of different personality and uh, person traits to ask our subjects themselves to sort of indicate you know how useful would this trait be for judging a person's moral mor moral character how their goodness or badness as a person their morality or immorality as a person and so on and then we use those ratings to to basically categorize the traits for us so if they if a trait was rated as bearing, uh, being very high on usefulness for judging a person's morality or character or goodness, that, that then counted as a moral character trait for us. So in that way, we're sort of just relying on ordinary people's conceptions of what this notion actually is. Um, and so what we found with that is that the, the traits that people think of as related to character or as relevant to character uh, relate to, but they're importantly different from uh, traits that are relevant to the notions of warmth and competence. And so these two notions, warmth and competence, have been uh, sometimes argued uh, in the past to represent the two fundamental dimensions of social cognition and person perception. Um, and so competence has to do with the person's effectiveness in achieving their goals, their ability to do certain things. Warmth is, a, is uh, more to do with a person's social life, uh, it's a little bit of a nebulous notion that sort of touches on morality to some extent, but then it also has to do with whether or not a person's kind of pleasant, enjoyable company to be around. Um, so it, it's related in some ways to morality, but also distinct because, of course, somebody could be very warm and interpersonally engaging and, and fun to be around, but not especially moral. Um, and there are obviously some really important moral traits like being honest or, or trustworthy that you could, you could have those traits without being particularly warm at all. Um, so in the existing models of person perception, warmth is emphasized as being a primary dimension that determines overall impressions of other people and social groups. And so in our research, we, we sort of thought um, that that's perhaps a little bit inaccurate. And in fact, what's really going to matter is morality and moral character. So we thought it was going to be worthwhile to try to separate morality from warmth and then sort of pit them against each other to see which one best predicted overall impressions that we form of other people, basically. Uh, interesting. So uh, in, your, in your article where you're investigating these topics, you concluded that moral character information powerfully determines the overall impression we form of another person with whom we have or expect to have an important or meaningful relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, could you talk a little bit about how you came to this conclusion and um, you know, it, kind of what you mean by it, flesh it out a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we looked at this question in a variety of different ways. We had a few different sort of methods to try to look at how impressions were formed and what sort of things predict and cause those impressions. 
Uh, one method that we started with, with, with just a sort of correlation or, or regression-based method where, and this was a method that we actually borrowed for, from some other researchers, and what we did is ask people to think of various people that they knew. Sometimes they were people that they knew personally from their own lives. Um, so, for instance, we asked people to think of somebody they liked or admired or somebody that they disliked and, and or didn't admire. Um, we also asked them to think of famous people. We asked them to think of some U.S. presidents. And we asked them to rate those targets on a whole bunch of different traits as well as to give us their overall impression of that person. So how positive or negative is your overall impression of this person? And that was essentially our dependent variable, what we were trying to predict. And we were looking at how the, the ratings on the various traits predicted the overall impression. So it's a method that allows us to tell, you know, which traits are most important in predicting these overall impressions. And we, we knew something about how to classify those traits based on the the pre-existing ratings that I mentioned earlier. So we knew that some of the traits were rated as really relevant to morality, others were rated as really relevant to warmth, some were rated as really relevant to both of those constructs, and then some were related as relevant to neither. Um, so for instance, intelligence is, is an ability trait that doesn't really relate that much to morality or warmth, or not centrally. Um, so, so, so could you so give yeah. some examples of some of the other traits that were yeah, sure, sure. related so, to mor morality or warmth? Or? Yeah, so we found traits that, traits that were related to just morality, which we refer to as the pure moral traits, were things like being honest, being just and fair, being trustworthy, um, being principled, being courageous. Uh, so they're all rated as really highly relevant to morality, not so relevant to warmth. We had traits that were relevant just to warmth, and they include things like being extroverted, playful, funny, uh, sociable, outgoing, and that kind of thing. Uh, they're not rated as that relevant to morality. And then we had traits, there are a number of traits that sit right in the middle. So traits like being kind, compassionate, um, even humble, I think, is in this category, uh, being grateful and forgiving. They're rated as both highly relevant to morality and, and to warmth. So there's some, definitely some overlap between those two constructs. Um, and then there was a final set, things like being organized or intelligent that are not that relevant to, to either of those constructs. So they're sort of competence traits. So my favorite aspect of the research um, that you published, which I think is complementary to the other experiments you just described, is the obituary study that you ran. Um, so you conducted this study to test the hypothesis that moral character information is more prominent in people's impressions of mm -hmm. others than in social warmth. Mm -hmm. And what I particularly like about this study is it uses descriptions of people that are more natural in some sense or less circumscribed than in the tightly controlled laboratory experiments that yeah. you described. And so I'm um, wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the details of that obituary study and how you came up with the idea to investigate person perception with obituaries. Yeah, sure. So. Um just one little uh, piece of information before that. I think I forgot to mention the sort of conclusion of those correlational studies, yeah, yeah, which, which was just that the, it was really the moral character traits that best predicted people's overall impressions. And then we saw the same thing in, in experimental studies that you referenced, where we sort of manipulate the traits that some hypothetical person has. And both of those methods basically showed us that it was the moral character traits that most powerfully predicted people's overall impressions. But as you said, um, particularly the experimental methods, they're a little bit artificial. And so, um, actually, uh, we, we turned to this idea about obituaries. It was, it was an idea we had fairly early on. It was actually something that Paul Rosen had floated initially. And he was particularly interested in this idea that what we're going to find in obituaries, which represent summary descriptions of a person's life, is moral character information. The idea is, you know, if you're trying to encapsulate what a person's life was about, we're going to find lots of character stuff because that's really important. And we did look for that, but we also realized that we could use this obituary method as a way to sort of provide convergent evidence for the sort of the main idea, which was the comparison between morality and warmth. So basically, we went to uh, the New York Times and looked at their obituary pages, and we collected about uh, 250 or slightly less than that in the end obituaries, we just sort of sampled them uh, in a random fashion. And we did two things with them. First of all, we asked some research assistants who were part of our project, but they didn't know anything about the hypotheses, to, to read through all of these obituaries 
And uh, for each one, they had to say how much information is provided in that obituary about a person's morality or their moral character, how much about their social warmth, and how much about their competence or their abilities. And is that information positive or negative? Most of the time it's positive, but for some obituaries it's negative. Um, and then, so then we had sort of some index of what's in the obituaries, and then we asked a separate group of our subjects um, uh, who, who uh, had not heard of these people before to read the obituary and just tell us, now that you know about this person's life, how positive or negative is your impression of this person? And we predicted those impressions from the, uh, the warmth, morality, and competence ratings. And basically what we found is um, all three of those dimensions independently predicted variance in the impression. So it sort of suggests that all three of them are relevant in some way, but in some independent way. But um, it was consistent with what we found in the lab, which is that the morality information was more important than the warmth information. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of a, a more naturalistic way to, to get at that idea. Is there anything in uh, either that study or in the ones that preceded it that really surprised you or changed the way that you think about morality and ethics or even think about a person's life after reading all those obituaries? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There were some there were some little surprises. I, there weren't any sort of major surprises where we were sort of floored by anything that we'd found. Um, Obviously, we weren't sure that moral character was going to predict impressions more strongly than warmth. And so, um, you know, we had some suspicions about that. But I, I do think that um, one of the things that I found surprising was that across all of these different convergent methods, we kept seeing this really strong dominance of the moral character information. You know, with projects of this sort, you often expect the evidence to be at least somewhat mixed. It might support the hypotheses on the whole, but there are usually some some sort of nasty little knots in there that go against the hypotheses. Here, it's just very consistent, and that, that was a little bit surprising. Um, so I guess that would be one. That would be one thing. Um, I guess another thing was in that correlational study I mentioned before. It was really the pure moral traits that did most of the work in predicting overall impressions. So being honest, trustworthy, courageous. And it wasn't so much the traits that blended morality and warmth, being kind and compassionate. And at least there, that, I was surprised by that. I, I, and I'm still not exactly sure why, what the explanation for that is, because I would have thought that those, those sorts of things would probably be on a par, but, um, but they weren't. So I think that's interesting that that blend of warmth and um, and moral character and sometimes how you're saying when it's separate, it seemed to be particular particularly diagnostic or particularly um, important for people. Um, one of the things that um, I was thinking about as I was reading your work is that in most of your studies you've provided descriptions of other people and that allows you to uh, directly ask about the importance of these different attributes. Um, yeah. And uh, of course, a limitation is you don't know how people actually kind of um, perceive other people or f actually form impressions. Right. And I think there often people might confuse different attributes for one another. So, and this relates a bit to what I was thinking of before when I was saying, well, the next research question to address might be to look at sort of the accuracy in people's impressions of others' character. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to me often in real life we can mistake warmth as being diagnostic of character when right. um, you know, a person who's warm, socially skilled may not actually be a moral person. And I have a colleague who put this really well, uh, Robert Livingston, he described it as mistaking social for pro-social, um, hmm. mistaking social skills for benevolence. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on sort of this mixture of warmth and character, um, if, either whether it's real or perceived, and how that might relate to both prior work that's conflated it, or also um, in different in people's impressions, maybe why when it's conflated, people uh, are not uh, they're saying that's not as important when it's pure honesty or warmth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and, and you know, to be honest, it's one that I don't really know the answer to yet. Um, you know, I suspect in the real world there probably is some real correlation between warmth and morality. Um, um, certainly in our, in our person perception data, we do find that there is a correlation. And I suspect that, you know, to the extent that a person has these warm social traits, they're likely to have some of the other pro-social things that, that you mentioned. Um, so, yeah, they, they, there could be some sort of uh, conflation for that reason. Um, in terms of how people actually judge 
the moral character of somebody else in real life where they're not given trait lists like we gave them in our studies? Uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, we, of course, we know from lots of studies in social cognition uh, that people readily form impressions of other people. Um, you know, there's work by Alex Todorov and others showing that people will very quickly form impressions of somebody's trustworthiness just based on a, a, a photo of them. Um, how accurate those judgments are is obviously, uh, I think, less well established. It sounds like you're doing something that is, is sort of getting at that question, which sounds really interesting to me. Um, but I think there are probably lots of other ways that we infer character in daily life as well. We don't just rely on faces. Obviously, we can't just rely on trait lists. But how people do that, I think, is a really interesting question that we haven't got a great answer to yet. I do think that warmth is much more easily observable. You know, you sort of get a sense of a person's warmth very early on in a series of interactions and you sort of, and that typically doesn't change too much after an initial interaction, but I think character is harder to tell. It usually takes repeated interactions. Um, it's more subtle, I think. So, you know, that's one question that I think would be really interesting to explore is you know, how, how people make those judgments. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, in some of your studies, you've examined um, different, different roles in different social contexts. And I was wondering whether you find large differences in what attributes people value or find important for different kinds of relationships. Um, or conversely, people largely value the same attributes, the same thing, regardless of the person's role in their life or the context. And the two uh, relationships or contexts that I was thinking of have to do with leadership and romantic relationships. These seem to be particularly important ones in our lives. Uh, yeah. and then, uh, so I was curious what you think about do people value moral character equally in all relationships or is it more particularly important in some? Yeah, so, um, you know, we haven't explored that space fully, but we did do a couple of experimental studies that get at this question to some extent. Basically what we're interested in is trying to explore some of the boundary conditions. So we sort of got to this point in the research where we'd found that character seems to predict impressions more than warmth or more strongly than warmth. But let's look at a, a bunch of different social roles and see how each of them matter for those roles. So we basically asked people to think of these hypothetical individuals that were going to fulfill a number of different roles. And we had 12 roles in total, including um, somebody who's going to be your surgeon, somebody who's going to be a judge in a legal case, your daughter's hypothetical fiance, um, uh, a close friend, a social acquaintance, and, and so forth. And um, a, a teacher of your child, things like that. Basically what we found there in both of those studies, I think it was for 75% of the roles, the moral character traits predicted overall impressions more strongly than, than did the warmth traits. There were three roles that where they were on a par, and I think these were things like a social acquaintance or somebody that you're going to interact with in a relatively casual, fleeting sort of manner. Their character and warmth were sort of on a par. So this is going back to your earlier question about what was surprising. We were a little surprised that we didn't find any roles in that set where warmth was actually more important than character. That's not to say they don't exist, but we, we didn't find them in that, in that study. Um, but one thing we, we can say about that is that as the roles were increased in their importance and our subjects made judgments of how important is it that a person fulfills this role well, um, as the importance rose, so too did the relative predominance of character over warmth in predicting people's impressions. So there is definitely some variance, um, but it seems like despite that variance, at least in our studies, um, it still seems like morality beats out warmth most of the time. I think that's really interesting that it's in the roles and context where the person is most important to you that character matters the most. And I wonder if it's in those situations that we're most vulnerable and mm. therefore we want to be most uh, on the lookout for people that might harm us. And yeah, so if moral right. character is sort of about um, not harming others or in helping others, it, it, it does make sense to me that uh, you would find that yeah. um, it'd be in those situations that we're most vulnerable. Um, yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And people so in, in the context of a romantic relationship, character was rated as more important than warmth. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that point that you make. It sort of gets at some of the theoretical reasons why people care about character, because it, it, it does really predict, arguably, how another person is going to treat you. And mm -hmm. yeah, when, when you're vulnerable, that's going to matter. So. Yeah. So uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that we both uh, study character from somewhat, from somewhat different angles, and I, I think that's clear from our conversation. So uh, again, the majority of my work is focused on how people view themselves and their own moral personalities, where uh, you've studied how people view other people's personalities. 
Um, and I think this raises a broader question about uh, the relationship between research on personality and person perception, because there do seem to be these independent streams of research. Mm. Um, so I'm curious um, what you think about sort of the relationship between personality and, and person perception. Um, are there differences in, maybe in the traits people value or find important for others versus themselves? And or um, all, another kind of related question is are, when we think of a model of the structure of moral character of a person, uh, personality, do you think there'd be a similar model that would hurt, uh, hold for person perception and sort of the things that are most important for judging others? Right, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And I, I certainly agree that these two fields seem to have been operating somewhat independently of each other. Like if you think of sort of old, older big five models of personality, they don't bear an obvious relationship to two dimensional warmth competence models. And so now we have, let's say a six factor model of personality, the hexaco model, so you might ask, well, how does that relate to a model of person perception where, let's say, you have morality, social warmth, and 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 competence? Um, I would say at the outset, I, I I think it'd be nice if these fields spoke to each other a bit more. Although I don't think there has to necessarily be convergence because the the social cognitive processes involved in person perception, you know, may not necessarily track actual personality. But I do think there are some potential correspondences, and this is something that you've sort of um, um, suggested to me in the past and I think it's really interesting to think about them so you know the honesty humility factor in the hexaco model um, arguably dovetails with m morality in person perception probably conscientiousness too in the hexaco model there, there's some relationship to morality there um, you could argue perhaps that warmth has a relationship with agreeableness and extroversion um, Competence perhaps links with conscientiousness, maybe openness to experience, although I think there are probably aspects of competence that also go beyond just pure personality and that have to do with sort of abilities rather than personality per se. Um, so I think you can sort of form these links and there's some reasonable correspondence, but there are also some gaps. I mean, it's not clear to me exactly how the emotionality factor in the Hexaco model is going to map onto person perception. It doesn't really seem to fit in um, the three-dimensional space that I've been describing, um, I, you know, I think it's an interesting question that could that could be explored further. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting that you point out. You know, in personality, we have a lot of research suggesting five or six dimensions. Mm. Uh, it seems now we're leaning towards six with moral character. Um, but when you have the person perception literature, it, it is possible that people don't view other people with that level of detail or, or yeah. nuance that maybe. Yeah. You know, people don't really see too much difference between if a person's more agreeable versus extroverted, whereas when people think about themselves, they have more information about that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I guess all that says is I agree with you that there do seem to be these links, um, and it will be interesting to see uh, more convergence over time to see yeah. is are the models and the structure actually similar, or maybe it's very different how we view others versus right. how we view ourselves. Right. I do think that the personality literature has tended to have more of this kind of exploratory bottom-up um, feel to it in comparison with the person perception literature, which has been a little more theory driven. So I think, you know, in part, there are these different approaches which have possibly given rise to some of these different models. Okay, very interesting. So uh, to end, uh, I would love to hear some of the current projects you're working on, uh, if there's any big questions that you're pursuing. Sure, yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the big questions which I've, I've been sort of intimating at is this idea that maybe it would be beneficial for us to think about a three or more dimensional model of person perception where you have morality, warmth, and competence. You know, one thing you could say about the research we've done is, well, let's just forget about warmth and just rename it as morality and contrast that with competence, which would be a two dimensional model, but just slightly reconfigured. But an alternative is actually to say, no, look, well, there is something that's really important about warmth and sociability that's distinct from morality and distinct from competence. So we're doing some studies at the moment um, with um, Jared Piazza and Justin Landy, uh, who's a graduate student here at Penn, which are trying to explore which of those two models is, is most accurate or uh, most, most useful. Um, we're also trying to make some progress, although progress is slow on this question about the structure of character in person perception. So obviously different character traits are quite different from one another. Honesty is very different from kindness. It's different from courage. Uh, I think one question that arises is what are the sort of core facets of character in the realm of person perception? Is it just this one sort of unidimensional entity or are there actually some, some dimensional structure to it? We think there probably is. But how you go about exploring that, you know, we've made a bit of progress, but 
would like to make some more. Well, I'd be interesting if the structure that uh, I've been working on about uh, consideration of others and self-regulation identity, if that bears any resemblance to what you ultimately find um, for yeah. the structure of person perception. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so. it's an interesting convergence. Well, I think we can wrap things up here. So uh, it's been great talking with you, Jeff. Uh, again, this is uh, Taya Cohen at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, speaking with Jeff Goodwin at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, great talking with you, Taya. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Okay, bye, everyone.